Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Lee, and I have the great fortune of having two esteemed partners uh, to share in the presentation today. Uh, Ms. Bethany Harris, she's the HR Director for Southside uh, Virginia Community College. And of course, everybody knows uh, Dr. Stone Rock, who's uh, in charge of this uh, esteemed event here uh, at, at New Horizons. We want to share with you some of the things that uh, we, 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 we've learned and know about uh, the process of working with adjunct faculty. Uh, and uh, also, uh, my two colleagues attended a national conference last month, or February, uh, to see what others are doing around the country with adjuncts. I certainly want to acknowledge my colleagues from uh, uh, Thomas Nelson, who presented last hour. I was listening in on your presentation. I, I left only to come prepare, all right? So I just want to let you know. So half of what I'm going to talk about, what I learned last hour, right? So just <laughs> <to let you laughs> know, okay? All right, so uh, l let's put things in, in, into context. We have 2,500, you know, 2,400 odd full-time faculty in the VCCS. And obviously we have very esteemed professionals that do a great job who, I mean, this conference is a testament to what they know and what they can do. However, we have 10,000 adjunct professors. In a given semester, you know, fall, spring, 8,600 to 9,400, but that's a head count that's a time stamp per semester. We know we have some who don't teach every semester. They come back every year, every other year, summers and things like that. So we probably have more than, you know, more than 10,000. So my, here's my argument I've been saying to Dr. Stonebrock for a while. Let's assume we had 10 million, $50 million to invest in professional development to work on complete 2021, right, to help student success. If we put $10 million into the full-time faculty, I'm going to expect that to be an uptick of professionalism and support that impacts students. But it's going to be small because we have full-time professionals who are at the top of their game, who've been worked on and work, you know, work to, uh, you know, to get better over their career. It can be from you know, one year to 40 years. Our adjunct professionals, and, and uh, Abby will talk about the different categories, they don't have the luxury of a full-time job with the same amount of 10, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years of experience. So their growth potential is significantly higher. I think the biggest investment should be into the 10,000 people who are adjunct professionals. So that's what we're here to talk about, why and how that group is so important and the things we can do to support them better. So today we're going to talk about some statistics around adjunct faculty, uh, the different types, you know, kind of categorizations. We're going to talk about how they recruit them, you know, select them, bring in and, and support them. Uh, we're going to talk about some technology tools that can help you manage this large group of folks. And we're going to give you some few tips that we've learned kind of along the way. We'll start and let Dr. Uh, Stone Rock share with us uh, uh, the first part of the presentation. So I'm not going to ask you to read this because it's impossible. But I thought we would perhaps just talk about some compelling statistics with regard to not only uh, specifically adjunct faculty, but contingent faculty. The conference that Bethany and I had the opportunity to attend in February or so was very interesting, and I wanted to share with you some of the statistics that they shared with us. Uh, nationwide, 71% of instructional faculty at college and universities are what are what considered contingent faculty. Now, this is anyone in a non-tenure track position, so it's part-timers, adjuncts, etc. 51% of those are adjunct faculty members, and if you isolate for community colleges. Now we're looking back up to about 71%, again, in the community college structure. 57% of those individuals have been with their institution six years or longer. 78% of those have been with a single college. They're not moving around. And 75% of those self-report that they want a long-term, permanent, and in the cases where they have the opportunity, tenure-track position at that institution. So that tells us automatically that these are individuals who are committed to their institutions and they are looking for longer term careers with those institutions. One of the things that was very, very interesting was some discussion that we encountered with regard to the types of adjuncts. And the discussion, uh, this has been around for a while, but uh, from a Gappa and Leslie study many years ago, and it's frequently referenced. They discussed the types of adjunct faculty members, but the focus was if you are putting together professional development programs, you need to make sure that you address all of these types of adjuncts or it's going to be unsuccessful from the get-go. 
Uh, the four types were aspiring academics, career enders, freelancers, and those specialist experts or professionals. Now, the way they define these individuals, briefly speaking, career enders are generally those who are retired or who are transitioning uh, into retirement from a profession, and they're just looking for something in a part-time teaching mode. Specialists, experts, professionals, etc., they have a full-time primary career elsewhere. Academic, aspiring academics, these are those that we were talking about largely earlier with the data point. Uh, they have a terminal degree and they want full-time status, full-time, uh, they're also oftentimes con considered or called full-time part-timers, which is not a good thing. And then last but not least, freelancers. And these are generally individuals who are not seeking a full-time, in, in cases of tenure, tenure-track position, or even a full-time position. They have a lot of different jobs, and they like that. They like being freelancers. The professional development component for us was specifically interesting because we know our programs have to address all of these interests, and they have to be available when those individuals are available for professional development. There were a number of benefits and drawbacks that were discussed. And they are things that we would expect to hear. There were some myths that were discussed, and there were some opportunities and myth busting to occur as well. I wanted to share that briefly with you. In terms of the benefits of adjunct faculty, having adjunct faculty on board at our institutions, I found the benefits that rise to the top of the list to be interesting for us as a discussion point. Institutional cost control, professional experience at the table, providing institutional flexibility for short-term labor gaps to address those, and as a mechanism for meeting the diverse needs of our institutions. Those were right at the top of the list in terms of the benefits of adjunct faculty and developing those adjunct faculty. In terms of some of the drawbacks, the things that rose to the top of the list, and this, this is where we had to get into some myth busting. There is a huge body of literature that when you look at the drawbacks, the drawbacks that are at the top of the list are their impact on student retention rates, their impact on successful transfers from two-year to four-year institutions, impact on student GPAs, impact on graduation and completion rates, and impact due to HR type issues, lack of pay equity, no benefits, overrepresentation of women, which gets into fair labor issues, et cetera. We know that women make up a large part of the part-time and adjunct faculty core nationally. We know that most of our adjunct and part-time faculty members are either under 35 or over 65. And we know that there's a significant variance in academic degree attainment. We would expect that. Those long-time tenure track, because they have the, the PhDs. Oftentimes, our adjunct faculty are working on them or they have a profession that doesn't require them. That's why we brought them in. They're specialists in those areas. But there is 68% gap there between those who have their PhD and are teaching in a university or college system and those who do not when we look at our adjunct faculty pool. And then we know that, and here's the irony, that our part-timers and our adjunct faculty member spend 90% of their time teaching our students. We know that to be true compared to our full-time faculty who spend about 60%. So the tip of the spear for us in terms of student success is in the classroom. This was, as Bethany knows, a huge point of discussion because as an institution such as the BCCS, and we had a contingent there at this conference, we did not want to hear some of this information. All of this impacts student success. Of course, there is, in terms of myth busting, contrary literature to suggest the opposite. So it truly depends on who you're talking to and the culture of the conference. Uh, we know from studies that have been done historically starting in about 2007 that students have been proven to learn just as much in classes that are taught by adjunct faculty as those classes taught by full-time faculty. So counterpoint number one, conference. Okay, so that was kind of our, our mode. We're like, but there's another body of literature here that we also need to be looking at. Um, they know we have st studies to indicate that our students are just likely to be retained by par part-time and adjunct faculty as they are by full-time faculty. So part of that discussion was that point counterpoint, which is a, a, a value for a good, healthy dialogue and discussion. 
one of the things coming out of that discussion and one of the things that we wanted to share with you today is no matter what side of the fence that those individuals sat on, negative impacts here or uh-uh, we can counter that with this, this body of literature. Depending on which side of the fence you sat on, everyone pretty much agreed with one thing. It is not about the quality of the adjunct faculty. That is not the point of discussion. The point of discussion is about inconsistent labor practices with our adjunct faculty and the fact that they have no benefits, the fact that they are hired at the last minute, they don't have time to plan, they don't have time to train. No matter which side of the argument you're on, that is a clear point of agreement. It's not an adjunct faculty issue in terms of quality. It is the infrastructure and the culture surrounding and or supporting our adjunct faculty or the lack thereof. And for all of us who have ever been an adjunct faculty member, we know this to be true. We're not the problem. The infrastructure around us is. And we have the statistics and the data to show that. Um, and one last thing, am I okay on time? You're good. Okay, I don't wanna rush, but I do wanna hit some of the highlights. Um, we did find some interesting, uh, some interesting literature that we followed up on after the conference as well. Uh, we found, for example, there is generally no difference between part-time and full-time faculty in terms of the time spent lecturing, discussing, giving exams, etc. Huge body of information to support that there's not a quality difference here. You can't kind of argue, but they only do this and full-time does this. No, we're finding that there's a very similar thread here. We're also seeing that both groups are equally likely to give essay exams and short, essay, short, uh, short answer exams, et cetera. So we can't play really that card either, that adjuncts are only doing multiple choice, et cetera. No, we've got the data to support that. And it's not one isolated study. It's a body of data su to support this. We found that uh, full-time are actually more likely to give term papers and group projects. So that was a differentiating factor. Part-timers did tend to use a little less technology uh, a fewer collaborative teaching uh, opportunities, a little less, and interacted less, generally speaking, because of oftentimes scheduling issues with their students, their colleagues, and their institutions at large. Part-timers, however, and adjunct faculty specifically, tended to be a little less familiar with campus services, such as counseling and advising and integrating the, that element into the classroom. Part-timers and adjunct needed a little more support. Whether they were getting it or not is a good question but they needed a little more support in areas such as the use of instructional technologies, collaborative learning, introducing innovative techniques in the classroom. We also found studies, good studies to support reliable ones. Part-timers significantly are significantly less likely to have received awards for outstanding teaching. And I think on, we can, we know, yep, that makes sense too. That's very, very likely. This creates all kinds of challenges and opportunities for us in terms of what we can do with professional development. A number of the benefits and drawbacks of those opportunities will be discussed by my colleagues today. One thing I really, really wanted to mention because the paradox of it I found to be, to be quite honest, kind of compelling. When you've sat through a conference for three days, you kind of go, ah, now that was worth coming for. So one of the moments for me that was a worth coming for moment is this statement in one of the studies I was looking at. Most challenging pedagogy, pedagogies and innovations are often resisted by students at first and result in lower faculty evaluations. That makes sense, we kind of know that to be true. So I'm gonna read it again. Most challenging pedagogies and innovations are often resisted by students at first and result in lower faculty evaluations. Check. The primary method of evaluation for adjuncts is student evaluations. Jack. Therefore, studies consistently show that adjunct faculty are less likely to adopt new practices and innovative and challenging techniques out of fear. Fear that the changes are going to result in a decline in their student evaluations and therefore impact their potential employment. Now that to me was kind of that moment worth going to the conference. That's the sense-making moment for me. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and Bethany. Thank you, Dr. Stone Rock. Um, so that, that was very, very interesting information. You know, the quality issue is, is kind of moot in that the fact that we need to have a better infrastructure. That's some of the things that we're here to talk about. And we've um, actually had uh, a session with the ASAC faculty 
Affairs Committee, and there's an initiative going on to ask the Chancellor for a Chancellor's Task Force on Adjuncts. And really the things we're talking about is creating that infrastructure that is designed to support these 10,000 folks who are, you know, really vital uh, parts of our community. They teach half of our coursework, right, within the VCCS and nationally. And that's kind of uh, important and that we need to uh, ensure that uh, uh, we're doing right by them. I will, I will share with you also that I've been an adjunct before. Dr. Poindexter here from JSAR, she and I have taught at the University of Richmond. Uh, and uh, they have a really good uh, infrastructure. So uh, throughout my career, I've, I've essentially taught one course a semester. I've taught at 10 different institutions over my career, having worked in uh, four different institutions of higher ed. And I will say eight of the 10, uh, the recruitment uh, process was, hey, I have a doctorate in HR I would like to teach. Okay, can you start uh, in three weeks or whenever the next semester started? I mean, you know, I mean, really just really poor practices. Uh, and so I'm not saying it as an HR guy saying, I know how, why, adjuncts, whatever. I mean, I've lived that experience. Some institutions do it well, some don't. It's really kind of remarkable. I always joke that, uh, uh, you know, most adjuncts really love it, right? It's a calling, they enjoy it because we don't pay them enough. And if you do the math on the time and effort they spend, you know, working, it's minimum wage, right? I mean, it, it really is, so um, it's important. 10,000 of them in the VCCS, we have to do better. I think that's a direct link to complete 2021, you know, uh, and, and getting there. I will also say, hey, I'm an HR guy. I know this to be true. Uh, if you are hiring, recruiting, selecting, and developing adjunct faculty without your HR colleagues, you're doing it wrong. Life is a team sport. The reason we're here is to support you in that evolution, and it varies by institution across the country, and it varies by institution within the VCCS. But the first thing is you need to engage your HR professionals. I shared yesterday at the session I did on the search committee saying the difference is as an HR person, I'm involved in the hiring process every day. I've been doing that for 20 years. Average hiring manager hires once every other year, once a year, five times, you know, over the course of a couple of years. We just have a lot of background and experience. So the first thing is, you know, you should be partnering with your HR staff to provide you with support you need to do what you have to do because uh, that's why we're here. Second part is planning ahead. We're going to talk about that a whole lot through our, our conversation. Uh, and because uh, folks uh, don't have to do it every day, they tend to do it as needed, as you would imagine. So planning ahead is essential. We should never, let me say this uh, about four times uh, over and over again, there should never ever be a situation, we'll say 1% of the time, that someone is hired at the last minute because a class made or didn't make. That should happen in less than 1% of the situation. However, I have several HR colleagues in the room, it re it's repeated every semester. Right? I mean, it, you know, then we don't, you know, they get off to a bad start and if the faculty gets off to a bad start, it's a chance that the students get off to a bad start, right? So that should never happen. We'll give you some techniques to get there. We're gonna say that you need to design a protocol, a process, a system for your recruitment selection, you know, placement and development of faculty. We're gonna give you some ideas in a moment. And then of course some technology tools will help you. We're gonna run through those. So let's start with recruiting. These are the things that I learned last hour with my colleagues from, uh, <laughs> you know, from, uh, <laughs> from Thomas Nelson, right, Beth? You know, so, <clears throat> I mean, you know, you gotta have a plan. How do you recruit faculty, right? For full-timers, we have a plan, you know, we go out and look for folks for adjuncts. We don't do that as much. It tends to come from the network of the, of the, of the department head or the program head who's in charge of hiring. Uh, so, for example, do you have a plan that you set up a, twice a year you do advertisements to say anybody in our community is interested in being an adjunct come apply or we're looking for adjuncts in these categories right so that's one protocol to bring folks in some colleges do career fairs uh, you know uh, once a year twice a year once a semester whatever just to bring people in and my colleagues from Thomas Nelson said it best I think Dr. Ursula Bach uh, who's not in she said hey it's a great opportunity for us you know to meet them and them to meet us and decide if we want to pursue this relationship or not right you know so all the deans get together and say, on the third Thursday of October, we're gonna have a career fair, we put it in the paper, you know, tell people what to bring to that meeting, bring a copy of your unofficial transcripts, your vita, yada, 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 you can be explicit in the paper, you show up, you know, spend five or 10 minutes with each of them, you know, in a, you know do a session to talk to a group of people, 
right? And then individual two minute sections, you know, kind of a speed dating sort of thing, or whatever. Many different ways of getting there. But you're bringing people into the funnel, right? I'm gonna show you something on the Chancellor's Faculty Diversity Initiative, which has been out there for six or seven, eight years. We have a database of folks, you know, who are interested in teaching at your colleges. We'll show you that. But the really big idea is this. You have to have a database, a pool. You know, HR folks call it a talent pool. So for every course you teach, you gotta have some bench strength. It doesn't matter that Jane or Bob has taught every year for the past 17 years, and you know they're gonna teach that course for you. What if they decide tomorrow, you know, that they don't wanna play anymore, that they win the lottery, they decide to get married, they decide to move away, they decide to just quit, right? So the issue is that for every course you teach, you should have people on the bench who are ready to get in the game if the game changes. And so you have to plan ahead. You have to start a process. So even today, if you don't have a need, you still should be advertising and recruiting and having people in some sort of talent pool ready for that next opportunity, right? It's like, put me in, coach, right? You know what I'm saying? I'm ready, I'm suited up, and when the opportunity happens. That way, three days before the beginning of the semester, when eight people just got laid off and didn't know they wanted that course, this person suited up, prepared, trained, and ready to go. That's just basic good HR. That's why you have to partner with your HR colleagues. Uh, and then for areas where you don't have any bench strength, you gotta do some advertising. So if you're in Whitfield and you, you, know, you need to teach physics at, you know, two, you know, at 8 a.m. or 10 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays, that's kinda hard. But knowing that today is important because you've analyzed, you've talked with your program heads or if you're the program, you talk with the HR person, we're saying, hey, we need to do something, start identifying people. And sometimes you might even have to grow your own. But the point is, starting now versus when you have it, because the last thing you want to do is cancel that section, right? <laughs> the students are counting on that section being held for their graduation, you know, which has to do with retention and all kinds of stuff. We can't cancel that section, right? The key is identify for every class you teach, you have to have some bench strength. Start now looking for those folks. You can't find them. You continue to recruit and advertise or you develop them, right? So you have to have a plan. That's the big idea on recruitment. Then uh, not everybody's using an applicant tracking system the right way. We use the state's RMS system, which is a good system, but it only does half the functionality. We're in the process as an HR community looking at an applicant tracking system or help us with that database and that sort of registry system that, uh, you know, online applications and been able to, to uh, search that database of people with a particular background and see if they can teach X, Y, Z. The registry will be, even if we don't have an opening, people will be able to say, hey, I'm interested in working for your institution at some point in the future when there's an opening, let me know when that occurs, right? So same technology is two halves of the same coin, but we have that coming for you. So uh, the Chancellor's Faculty Diversity Initiative, we talked about it. You can go out on the VCCS website. There's a whole page dedicated to it. It has a lot of good information about uh, in folks interested in teaching. The program is open to everybody, but it targets minority uh, professionals or minority graduate students. It's out there, and it has some good information. So, you know, so that's an example of the kind of job applications from the inside of the applicant tracking system. Uh, but here's a snapshot to show you that folks come to the VCCS website, and as a system office uh, site, you know, we say, hey, are you interested in teaching within the VCCS as an adjunct? And then somebody, you know, my staff puts people into the buckets where they're interested in teaching. So almost every college, you, there's applicants out there. So someone in, in your community, or multiple people in your community, meaning that each of your program heads can have access to the system. And when someone says, I'm interested in teaching at Paul DeCamp or Patrick Henry, you can click on that and you'll see the applications of those folks. So this is just a talent pool, right? Of folks who are interested in teaching at your colleges, they can get to it from uh, the VCCS. All right, so again, this is just an applicant tracking system. I was giving you an example of that technology, all the different jobs that might be available at any given time. Uh, the hiring managers and the, the people in the search committee gets access to the uh, people's information. And as you see, for a particular job, they apply now. So for those who haven't you know, seen an applicant tracking system, uh, uh, that's a quick example. All right, we didn't pause after you to ask folks for questions. I don't know why. So we'll pause now. <laughs> we'll pause now. Uh, questions for Abby or me, you know. So we talked about recruitment. We're going to talk about selection and, and placement, and then we'll have some time at the end also for for uh, for Q and A. So yes, ma'am. Uh, 
once, sorry, once you recruit and you've got that bench strength, yep. uh, quite often we can't place people into a course yep. the com upcoming semester. How do you maintain that candidate's great, interest? Great question, great question. One of the things we hope to do when we get an applicant tracking system that's for the whole system, right, you know, that has that database, Ideally, my office will have someone who can keep those folks engaged, right, you know. And some of the things you could do is simply just sending them articles and information from time to time, letting them know things like New Horizons exist, you know, inviting them to things on campus, but keeping that group of folks interested and engaged in, in uh, 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 your community. Think about, we all belong to some listserv or some, you know, every day or every week you get an email from somebody, right? you did business with or whatever, it's the same idea, keeping people connected to your mission. So those are some of the things you can do. Invite them to campus. I mean, think about it. When people come to your campus, whether they're potential employees or students or community members, they learn something about the institution, they get more excited about it, right? So, you know, one of the things is to do is just to bring them to campus for professional development opportunities or events that happen on campus and keep bragging about what's going on to keep interest, you know, keep, you know being interested. But you're absolutely right, right? Keep them engaged. Yeah. Yep. And some more, we got some tips later as well. Other questions? Uh, we're gonna go right to left, okay? Uh, well, we, I think Mike is there first, so go ahead. All right, good afternoon. Um, as an adjunct professor who's always looking for a full-time job, um, I go on the website and I fill it out, but sometimes I see where it says pay ban S1 or some other number, and then on some sites, they actually have a number. Can we make it consistent where there's always a number or something? Because I can never find what S1 or S3 or S5 means. I know there's a sheet for it, but I just can't find that sheet to translate well, well, that to yeah, those that, numbers. That's very good feedback. Uh, uh, if the VCCS would only be consistent in anything, that would help <laughs> us. <laughs> but, but the other part is, we were talking about this yesterday at another session. We tend to speak to the world in our language, not the language they understand. So that's something for us to work on. Thank you for the feedback. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Darren Camp, and I'm from Montgomery College in Rockville, Maryland. So I, I'm not too familiar with VCCS regulations, but what is the limit on part-time teaching? Uh, did the Affordable Care Act Yes. Put a cap yeah. on that, and are, well, is each campus talking to one another? We are. We are. Uh, the the, the uh, Affordable uh, Care Act caused us to double down on the policy we've had for the past 30 years. Okay. <laughs> it was already there. It had changed, but we weren't necessarily following it the way the law required. That's the truth. So essentially, uh, adjunct faculty can teach 24 hours in an ad I mean, in a academic year, right? So it's, you know, 12 and 12, right? And there's actually a slight uh, a caveat to that, which we'll talk about, and when we talk about a new position we created uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, Judy. Really interesting information so far, uh, and uh, I'm uh, remembering what was said about the infrastructure is um, is uh, often the culprit in helping us be consistent and, and uh, uh, do the best we can with uh, with adjunct instructors. Um, I wonder if um, you're also aware and could share with us some exemplary programs or model institutions where the infrastructure is strong, and we might um, uh, follow some of their practices. Uh. I was going to ask my colleagues from Thomas Nelson for their checklist of forms and processes. So, you know, we, you know, Abby and I probably need to get together and create some sort of repository. So I would talk to those two ladies right there. That would be a great start, okay? Yes, and we're talking about, that's why we're talking about that Chancellor's Task Force on, uh, on adjuncts, because we want to and plan to do exactly what you're describing. Yep. Um, I'm an adjunct at Thomas Nelson, actually, and I was also at Tidewater. Hi, guys. Um, Aprile Castagna. I, I've been thinking that maybe there'd be a great way to have adjunct professors um, have one position where they could teach at several different institutions, but yet it would be one position, like an actual formal position within the VCCX. Right. So you'd be well, that's hard migratory. To do. That's hard to do, but there are some ways of making it easier, and, and we understand that we the cross-boundary thing doesn't matter to you, it matters to us, 
And so we need to lower some of those boundaries. And that's why we, we, we really want to look at what we do, how we do it, our practices generally, so that we can uh, share the best practices and work on the challenges. So that's kind of where we're, where we're headed. All right, so I'm going to press ahead and then give, make sure we got time for uh, Ms. Harris. So uh, video, in, well, this is a selection, the process of selecting them. It should not be a program head in their, in their, in their office in the middle of the night saying, Bob or Susie, we should, it should be professional, right? Because half of our full-timers come from the adjunct pool. So there should be rigorous you know, scrutiny of applicants and rigorous selection. So we recommend three-member committee or something like that, people in the department. Um, uh, a screening committee is the idea of having a group of people who volunteer this year to be the group that looks at all the, you know, the, the applications. The serial review could just route them between department members who are part of a group to say, we got an application today, we're gonna, I'm a, you know, I say yes, no, maybe to this, I pass it to the next person. After three people have reviewed it, that person gets put into a pre-qualified pool that we will look at later, as an example. Uh, HR can help you, depending on your college and how it's, how it's staffed and helping you with that review process. And then I would also say, you know, we get a lot of applicants, people just don't know that their professional degree is gonna, you know, uh, be, uh, we're qualified them for teaching. We spend a lot of time with people who aren't qualified. There's some ways of getting there. Talking to an HR person, I'll give you a couple examples. And then we'll talk about our video interviewing system that we have available. So one way to pre-qualify is on that website we have for the Chancellor's Faculty Diversity Initiative, you'll find a copy of this article from the Chronicle. I give it to everybody that asks about a job because it explains the SACS requirements for who can and cannot teach, right? Because otherwise it takes 15, 20 minutes to explain to people this article have them read this first, and that's a way of pre-qualifying them, right? So you don't have to. Send them to the website. We even have an auto-generated uh, email. It says, don't call us, <laughs> read this article, and read all these FAQs first, right? They hit the send button. That technology saves you time and effort, right? And we learn that through experience. And then we have a video interviewing system. We have this for all, our, all of our colleges, right? So essentially it goes like this. You put in that name and address, I mean, you know, name and email address, and you have a pre-group, uh, pre-selected group of questions. You hit send, it goes off to them. On their smartphone or computer or whatever, they hit a button and it records them for one to five minutes. To, you, you set the length to respond to the question you want them to answer, right? They hit send, it is done, and your three-member committee or whomever you want to be involved can go in and anytime they want, this is a hosted solution, and click on their responses. So you've got a pre-interview for any candidate at the time they hire, I mean, at the time they apply, if you so choose, or people you send to later. My recommendation several times has been because it's a hosted solution that we don't have to pay for the memory, I would do it for every uh, adjunct applicant, right? And the beauty is you don't have to look at it until you need someone, right? So which means it's gonna be out there in six months or eight months, and you, now you need someone, you can go in and see an interview you've already selected, you know, set up for them. Saves time and effort, and then if you really want to talk to them, then you bring them in, right? But the key is you've pre-qualified a dramatic number of folks simply using technology. It takes you a few minutes with, from your program to decide what are the four to ten questions we want to ask people, and if they're really interested, they're going to go through that process. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Lee, can you um, tell us again the name of the software package that it's you're using for that? It's called Interview Stream. Ask your HR manager. He or she you know, can give you access to it. You know, we've had it for about a year, Jerry. Uh, so uh, it's out there. Uh, Maria. Dr. Lee, is it possible to do the screening process? No, no, no. I called you Maria. You called me Dr. Lee. Dr. Poindexter. <laughs> Dr. Lee, is it possible to do the video streaming with, app, with voice only? For EEO uh, yeah, issues, I think so uh, is it, Jerry? Um, give, me, give me a little bit more specifically what you want to do. Can we hide the the faces for EEO issues or concerns? You Still probably, hear the you, voice. Yeah, you probably could. The, an the responses to the yeah. questions, see their names, but not see their faces. I'm, 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 I'm sure you probably could, right? Yeah. Or tell them to <laughs> put a piece, sheet of paper there. Right? Okay. <laughs> That's a workaround. It's called a workaround. <laughs> a high tech workaround. <laughs> uh, Jerry. Well, one of the things, though, you could do, follow up to this question about how to stay connected in contact, because 
we've dumbed down because of emails. They really don't have that, that contact viability. We can use the video technology to send, uh, you know, how you doing? Here's some, quest here's some things going on. And so it, it, it allows us to keep connected in that ongoing process of recruitment as well. All right, so uh, we talked about the kind of holding tech or talent pool idea, and that's for your placement, right? You've got a pool of folks, you pre-qualified earlier, you may have pre-qualified them in January, and then you're gonna use them in the summer you know, or the fall. But they're there or waiting for you. We have this thing of a two semester adjunct. We, we now State Board has approved that we can contract with certain people <coughs> once for that academic year. I mean, you can give them classes for the fall and spring at the same time. The details of that are coming. We have a, we'll have a contract and a procedure that will help you to manage your workforce if you're managing adjuncts a little better. We'll give you greater detail later. Uh, my colleague is gonna share some information with you on a couple other items. Uh, I'll also say like John Tyler and a couple other ones will give adjuncts when they sign a contract like a $50 stipend to get them loaded and started in their system to do online training or orientation, act, you give them access to the library and other things to get them started earlier versus waiting to the last minute to see if the classmates makes, right? So they're in the system. We're talking about getting them going and getting them started early. All right? Okay. Um, I'm going to take over from where, we, where they're actually hired. Um, as Abby said, we went to a, a conference on adjuncts and we did have a couple of aha moments where we were taken away. Um, one of the things after obviously pay, the, one of the leading um, complaints from adjuncts is that they're coming in and they're not prepared. They're not given information and as Chris pointed out earlier, you know, sometimes they say, okay, you're hired, you know, welcome to class. So we need to look at ways to better prepare our adjuncts to go into the classroom. Um, we often have, um, I'm from Southside Virginia Community College, so we're in the, the rural horseshoe. So oftentimes when we're hiring uh, adjuncts, they are new to the classroom. And sometimes the expectation is they're going to know certain things that they don't. So one of our challenges, uh, our new president is, is looking at, and our new VP of academics um, we're going to discuss, is how to better prepare our adjuncts day one or before day one moving in. Um, the $50 stipend is, is a good idea if you have a, a, a budget. You get them in, get them a new orientation. Um, Nothing can replace that. However, there are some tools um, that are available and that uh, are system-wide. What's the, what's the ETA now for Silk Road? Uh, <laughs> Jerry? <laughs> the ETA for uh, Silk Road. We're going to be able to launch within the, the next month. Uh, we will uh, be able to move as fast as a college wants to move terms of implementing that process. Okay, um, and what we're talking about is Silk Road. It's an HR onboarding system. Um, and we can use it for, for two, two main reasons, I would say. One is to get that annoying HR payroll paperwork out of the way. You know, we're all experienced with giving the big packet of information to adjuncts and they look at it and they have this really puzzled look on their face. Um, it, it's never, it's never a, a pleasant task, um, but there are ways that we can improve it. This is an online HR onboarding system, um, and again, for that purpose, it's a, it's a great tool. Um, this, this, the slide that you see is from Lord Fairfax. They were the first implementer. Um, our, our colleagues at Reynolds have also implemented, and we have been in since January. Um, what it does is, let's, let's start day one. You have made the selection, you're hiring an adjunct. They get an email welcoming them to the college and directing them to this online portal. The online portal provides them with various information. Um, you can see along the top, if, or if you can, um, there's some different tabs, benefits, professional development, payroll, document library, et cetera. On the side, uh, you see a task list. So as they're first hired, they'll have a few of their main tasks, you know, the, the I-9s that we all want to get out of the way to make them legal. Um, an offer letter, some of their basic information. You get all that stuff out of the way up to begin with. Um, they also have, over on the side, they have access to handbooks. So, in, in speaking of orientation in a way that this can be used to, to assist you, if for some reason your new adjunct is not able to come in for a one-on-one -on -one, um, discussion with their dean or 
to come into a, a group orientation, this is a way to provide them targeted information at times when you think that they need it. So, um, at, for example, developing the syllabus, assuming they don't know or don't have tools for it, uh, most of your colleges do have uh, online assistance for that. You have uh, sites to direct adjuncts to or your teaching faculty to. But how do you tell them? When do you tell them? What, where do you point them? Uh, this, the task list uh, that you can develop, and as Jerry said, it depends on the college, can give them targeted information. So say day one you want them to get the information on how to develop a, a syllabus. You can send that, you can set that so that they have to go into the system and complete a task, or you can send them a self-completing task, which means they would just get an email saying, uh, here is a resource, it gives them the links and points them to it. So it's nothing that you're having to do physically, manually, it's something that's built into the system. Say a little later into the semester you want to give them information on sales for, your, uh, for students that are experiencing difficulties they could get the targeted time. So you can sit down with your, your deans, your, um, your uh, faculty to come up with a list. Uh, it, it, can be, it can be as involved as you want. It can be as basic as you want. And uh, do we have a, an estimated time on when they're gonna hire someone to, to assist with the portal? Well, we're working on it now. I think we have a plan that six months from now, all colleges will have implemented the system. That's our target goal, so we're working through the startup of all the colleges right now. Okay. All right. So this is another view of what the employee would see. It would show their current task list, their completed to-dos. Um, you have all of their basic payroll information in here. This is a view of what a supervisor would see, for example. So if you are a hiring dean and you have a number of employees and you have outstanding tasks, you would have a list. Um, one of the questions that we get oftentimes is, how do I know that I have something out there? And you get an email when a task is activated. So if you're hiring, you know, Susie Q to teach psychology, uh, you know you have a couple of things to do for that employee and they would be in your um, Silk Road uh, task list and you get the emails to complete them. Likewise, if you set up teams um, to complete different things, uh, for example, we set, we set up some of our technology uh, in, into Silk Road uh, for, as far as access. So we have teams for our IT, for our PeopleSoft folks to go in and uh, complete tasks as they are hired. Another thing that we incorporated, and uh, this is gonna be up to the individual colleges, we incorporated uh, the faculty qualifications for, for adjuncts and for our full-time into Silk Road. So when a dean is hiring um, a, a new faculty member, a new adjunct member, they would go into Silk Road and they have a page where they complete the um, faculty qualifications to assign rank. Uh, that information, depending on how you have your structure, can go for different approvals. So for example, when our hiring departments, if it's an off-campus site, hires a new fac uh, adjunct faculty member, they'll go in and they'll complete the, the qualification form. It would then go through Silk Road to the dean who signs off on it, and then it would come to us so that we can review. Uh, uh, one of the, or two, two advantages of this is we can then use the data for sex credentialing. Um, we keep it in a database. And the second benefit is that we have that that we can then share with the adjunct faculty member. So when they're hired, sometimes they don't know what rank they're hired in. Um, we have a good example in, in the back, you know, the, the S1, what does that mean? What does my rank mean? So we have a tool built in that we can provide that information to them and give them, okay, this means you're in S1 and this is the, this is the commensurate salary. Okay, so um, I'll let you all ask questions about Silk Road in just a minute, but let me finish this, uh, this slide. Um, just a couple of other tips, things, some takeaways that uh, Abby and I got from the conference um, and, and from different conversations that we had there. Some things to consider. Um, 
oftentimes adjuncts feel excluded from different professional development opportunities because uh, as Abby mentioned and as we all know it's often a part-time job it's something that they're doing in the evenings on the weekends so if we can set up uh, basic seminars teaching basics um, for our new hires then we need to think about when we offer it. Are we offering it in the evenings? Are we offering it on the weekends? Uh, are we offering it for free? Is it, is it a pay? Um, we could set it up so that it's like a career readiness certificate as a pre-qualifier pre like Chris mentioned um, and use it in the screening process. Um, I believe uh, Chris was, was talking about our Thomas Nelson colleagues and they actually have adjunct coordinators not all colleges are lucky enough to have full-time positions. So what we are exploring is taking our existing um, administrative support positions who actually function in this capacity for a large portion of their uh, work, work performance and pool them, get best ideas, uh, give them all the resources, uh, have them share it across our college because we are very spread out and then uh, make them an adjunct center for excellence. Uh, adjunct mentors, that was another takeaway from the conference. So, you know, oftentimes, again, we're putting them in there and assigning them a mentor. This can also be set up in Silk Road that the mentor is given their, the new hire's information and the new hire is given the contact information for the mentors. Same thing with cohorts, giving that employee information. <coughs> Excuse me, my mouth is very dry, I need some water. Uh, giving them uh, a new adjunct information on their cohorts. So if they're a biology instructor, giving them, you know, the names of their other biology, biology instructors. Good gracious. Um, and we've already mentioned uh, recognition and reward. Uh, the last thing is adjunct support survey. They had a really good tool on Delphi that uh, George Mason has developed for an adjunct survey. We are intending to put that out. Thank you. great tool that George, Mas George Mason developed. Um, we are going to tailor it and send it out to our existing uh, adjuncts uh, uh, currently. And then we're also going to incorporate it into Silk Road as something at the end. You know, you've been through this process. Give us ideas on how to improve. So we're going to put it out again to our existing adjuncts to get information, to get feedback, to see how we can better support them, and then see moving forward as a continuum. All right, uh, in the interest of time, we're going to summarize here, and then the instructors, we're going to step outside of the room and take any questions or uh, exchange ideas with you so that the next group can get started. Uh, but a quick review. We talked about adjuncts and uh, some statistics about them and the importance of them. Within the VCCS, our largest contingent employee group that teach half our courses, they are really important to our mission. Uh, that they really serve us well, but we need to do better uh, by ser ser uh, supporting them with a, uh, a greater infrastructure. That they're all, not all the same, but they have different aspirations and goals for their, for their lives, and we have to support them that way. And hopefully we gave you some key ideas and suggestions around how to recruit you know, and develop them. And we also forecast the idea that we plan to, uh, to do more with you in creating a system to support them a little bit better. So thank you for joining us this, uh, uh, this morning, and we'll step outside and hopefully uh, greet uh, uh, some of you and share some ideas, and hopefully you'll share some with us as well. Thank you again.